it could be argued that the best landscape photographs are taken whilst walking. Even if you are fit, by all means use a car, even public transport, but leave it and take a walk. Treat it as a gym, the views are great, travel light, but leave plenty of room in the rucksack for essential food and a drink. But if this means taking just one lens, which should it be? For many years I used the Olympus Zuiko 12-50 lens. It is not one of their posh lenses, but works perfectly within its limits. Being a variable aperture zoom, its maximum aperture of f3.5 only works at wide angle, losing two whole stops at telephoto. Much of my work is in good light, so lack of light was rarely a problem. And anyway, it is an excellent lens for anyone on a tight budget. Then came along the 12 to 100 lens in their Pro range and a bit more expensive. The maximum aperture is f4, but constant throughout its 8.5 times zoom. The lens has its own image stabilizer that works with the camera's stabilizer, and when it comes to hand holding, you can get away with murder, so a tripod is not required. So what's in my rucksack? Well, nothing much. I have my lunch, drink, a map, spare pullover, first aid kit, and oh, I nearly forgot, an Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II plus the 12 to 100 Pro lens. I don't need anything else. Therefore, the images are taken with this combination. Nothing else. Less is more. By the way, if you arrive by bus or train, a grubby rucksack is more secure. An upmarket camera case says one thing. Steal me. I don't advertise what I plan to do whilst travelling or indeed on a walk. One of the unsung benefits of micro four thirds is extra depth of field, possibly two stops more than full frame. When required, it is easier to achieve sharpness from front to back, even without a knowledge of hyperfocal distance. This works well with landscapes having foreground interest that needs to be sharp. Because of this, it is sometimes incorrectly assumed that differential focusing is not possible with micro four thirds. Probably said by those who do not understand photographic basics and are wedded to their camera's automation. I learnt the real craft of photography the traditional way by joining a camera club, which is still the best way to learn photographic techniques not swept aside by the smartphone. So what is hyperfocal distance? If shooting in low light, the camera is forced to use a wide aperture, reducing depth of field, critical even with micro four thirds. Depth of field can be increased, particularly with wide angle and standard optics, prime or zoom, by manually focusing about one third into the scene, which for expediency is around what, uh, 50 feet. This brings the point of focus forward, and as depth of field extends twice as much behind the subject as in front, foregrounds will come into focus. Depth of field is wasted if the camera is focusing on a background. If you are a slave to auto, much of this and what follows is going to be irrelevant. Auto produces the perfect average. If you are happy with that, who am I to argue? But imaginative photography is a bit more than pressing a few buttons and pointing a camera. Therefore, it will come as a surprise that sometimes 
I take my photographs on program. Like auto, program automatically selects the correct shutter speed and aperture for the current light strength. It can be controlled, but otherwise it defaults to a fast shutter speed to benefit hand holding. In program, you can also control exposure compensation, metering modes, and white balance. These can improve images, but they cannot be done in auto. On a country shoot, I keep the camera on program whilst looking for subjects. Whilst a landscape is unlikely to disappear, the lighting adding that touch of magic can. So I take a quick snap on program. If everything is hunky-dory, and of course being a real photographer, afterwards I switch to aperture priority adjust depth of field, and take another photograph. On program, aperture or shutter priority, I spot meter. Shoot at 200 ISO, exposure compensation set to minus 0.3 EV, white balance on daylight or cloudy, but not auto. I save the raw and execute quite a bit of work in Adobe Lightroom, often shooting with that in mind. For this program, I make JPEG copies from adjusted RAW files, cropping to 16 times 9 ratio for YouTube from 4x3, so I leave space around the image. Equally important as research is a project. Why am I taking these images? A project can influence how they are taken. If you can shoot with more than one task in mind, that is to the good, and for this, RAW is a godsend. I do not use filters, because you are locked into them, and, like any true artist, I keep changing my mind. Changes are made in Latrum. It offers greater flexibility, and when I make a mistake, I undo it. Time to come back to the 12 to 100 lens. An 8.5 times zoom offers considerable scope for composition, from a generous wide angle equivalent to 24mm in film to a decent telephoto equivalent to 200mm in film. If you are shooting wildlife, you need something more powerful. Also, much is said about the Zuiko 7-14 wide angle zoom. It is certainly impressive, but more suitable for interiors than landscapes. It reduces mountains to molehills. I prefer a 3,000 foot fell in the Lake District to look like a mountain and not an insignificant lump. Whilst composition is important, Lighting is the one thing that makes or breaks a photograph. I don't subscribe to the golden hour as the only time to take landscapes. A landscape photographer should be able to take successful images at any time, provided the weather is doing the right thing. For the big view, sharp foreground interest adds the third dimension, otherwise it looks two-dimensional. Micro Four Thirds is better for keeping everything sharp from front to back, even at wide aperture. At Ditchling Beacon I used f8. The focal length is 25mm, that is 50 in film, the classic focal length for a standard lens. To convert micro four thirds focal lengths to film, just double the number. At Stone Farm Rocks near East Grinstead, the rocks are just a few feet away. Using f11 with the lens at 12mm, there is overall sharpness. In fact, the light was so intense, 
I didn't use the hyperfocal distance, so I left the autofocus on. How lazy can I get? I also used f11 at Chepstow Bridge. I zoomed in a bit to 20mm, still maintaining overall sharpness. Important, where an architectural feature leads the eye into the picture. Notice too how the clouds mirror the shape of the bridge. I can arrange anything, even the impossible. Incidentally, when working on aperture priority, I normally start from f8 or 11. Early morning at Derwentwater in the Lakes District. The intensity of light now considerably less. One sixtieth of a second at f4. Zooming towards telephoto at 41mm, 82 in film, reduces depth of field. But micro four thirds comes up trumps, keeping everything sharp, helped by the image stabilizers in both lens and camera. A superb example of advanced technology at the service of the photographer. A few more shots, all handheld using traditional photographic skills and up-to-date technology to maintain overall sharpness. The most difficult skill to master is composition, the ability to develop a photographic eye. I can see a picture at 50 paces, but that takes experience, which I cannot teach. We live in an instant gratification world, but creative photography is a long winding road and with few shortcuts. This applies to most other art forms, music, painting, and the written word. I learnt to see a picture by joining a camera club. Internal competitions were invaluable, where an invited judge pulled my photographs to pieces, warding them only four out of ten. Oh dear! But I stayed the course and learnt a lot. At Castath Dinas Brand, near Llangothlan, it is the repetitive arches and distant view that holds our attention. At the same spot, now zooming into full telephoto, the distant hills become contracted, reducing the perspective, but increasing their importance as a background pattern. The ability to see this with the naked eye is the hidden art that takes time and no amount of fiddling and fumbling around with camera controls is going to tell you that. The photographic eye is also in evidence at Plus Neweth, albeit a record shot. Mooching around I found a composition with the formal garden in the foreground and the castle featured in the last two images in the background. Useful for a project about Castath Dinas Brand because it sets the scene, heralding a visit to the castle. Our eyesight is better than any camera, and contrast is the one area where technology is still lacking. Before taking a picture, the photographer has to foresee what parts of the composition could be overexposed or underexposed. And in this instance, sunrises and sunsets are difficult to judge. Playing devil's advocate, I am ruling out HD. 
D R because I am hand holding. Nevertheless, and at the risk to my eyesight, I spot meter near the sun, underexposing the image a little. Here, the OMD's electronic finder is amazing, but much of the magic is accomplished in Adobe Lightroom, and that is another story. I finish with my other forte, architecture, starting with exterior views. Light and shade played an important role at Tinton Abbey in the Wye Valley. It was late in the day, within minutes of the sun disappearing behind a hill. So I worked quickly, no time for faffing about. I spot metered highlights to avoid overexposure, which can easily happen on matrix metering because much of the composition is shadow. Overexposed highlights are more difficult to correct than underexposed shadows, but the caveat is unfortunately noise. But I think I've got away with it, the rule for much of my photography. Stepping inside a cathedral, church or stately home is where the superior technology of the 12 to 100 lens excels, especially the image stabilizer. Tripods are not permitted in National Trust properties and many cathedrals. They are a hazard and in the unfortunate event of an accident, Compensation for the injured party could be more expensive than repairing the camera. A high-tech camera can make a photographer overlook traditional photographic skills. When shooting in low light, even posture and holding your breath matter. Take a close look at this shot of Chester Cathedral. Is it sharp? The shutter speed was a quarter of a second. The aperture f4, but it is sharp from front to back. Even the text of the Bible is visible, and don't forget, hand held. I focused on the choir screen to create the hyperfocal distance, so no tripod, and neither is there anything convenient to lean on. With stained glass windows, you have additional light. At York, the shutter speeds range from 125th to 160th of a second. Telephoto increases camera shake, but the stabilizers in lens and camera have done an excellent job. Light from stained glass can be creative under certain conditions, and although the photographer is indoors, it is the weather outside that produces the magic. I visited Chester Cathedral when returning home from Wales. It was 5 p.m., the sun now quite low in the sky. Colours from stained glass windows were projected across the cathedral floor, creating abstract images of fancy. Wonderful to behold, but only visible early or late in the day when the sun is low or most of the time in winter. Again, I spot metered, preserving the rich colours, the areas not receiving sunlight fading into the background which I do not correct in post-production. A difficult mix to get right is a dark interior with a bright window in the same shot. It is easy to underexpose the interior or overexpose the window. Cameras and software have improved and whilst I tended to underexpose, now I can allow the window to become slightly overexposed in the knowledge that it can be corrected in Lightroom. This is only possible with the later OMD cameras and 
Lightroom, allowing a bit more latitude in exposure, reducing the risk of noise. I am a doer, not a photographer who follows obsolete rules. I get results where others fear to tread. I understand those photographic basics that can be used with today's advanced technology, ridding myself of what is no longer required. Therefore, my approach is spontaneous, grabbing the inspirational moment I don't hang about. The Zuiko 12-100 Pro lens allows me to do just that. It gives that essential freedom of operation technically and artistically. Take the lens image stabilizer. It is used in conjunction with the camera's stabilizer. It gives me freedom to see a picture immediately and at 50 paces because I am no longer weighed down or obstructed by superfluous gear. Also, because of extended depth of field, micro four thirds is ideal inside cathedrals under low light. Even at full aperture, it is difficult to believe the overall sharpness. Yet, with a traditional knowledge of photography, differential focusing is possible. You can have it both ways. Until improvements in technology make me think again, the 12-100 is my workhorse for the foreseeable future.